Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. Once again, we're so glad that you have joined us. We're going to go to the, one of the small books in the Bible, the book of 2 Peter. Take your Bible. Turn to 2 Peter, and let's start with verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This is trying to give us a good model of, of inspiration, is it yep. not? Talking about inspiration, exactly. And we've talked about inspiration a number of times, and, but this, this gives us some very, very clear um, information. Um, what about that? Uh, if you see someone proclaiming some new message, they might call it present truth. Uh, should you rush out and follow them? Is this saying that do not follow one man, that you have to have a group of people studying the Bible to come up to a conclusion? Is that what this is saying? Sounds like it, doesn't it? Now, wait a minute. Uh, what about Jonah when he showed up at Nineveh? He was one man. Yes. And he had all kinds of new stuff to say to them. And Not so, too much. In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Oh, what, eight, eight words or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> unless, yeah. unless you repent and go well, back to the prophets. It's still information. Yeah. It's still information, just like you're talking about yeah. here. And it's one person. But Is that new information, though? No, that was Old Testament, new prophets well, of Israel. Well, I'm sure uh, to a lot of those people of it was new information. I, I tend to agree. I mean, that was a startling message to them. And uh, maybe they had some history that they could go back to and study and check him out pretty quick. But uh, on the basis of what he said, they, they changed. Mm -hmm. So they weren't waiting for a big group. Yeah. Hmm. And maybe it's possible some, there were some eyewitnesses to his being deposited there in that could location. Well, could well be. I mean, and if there were, that would add a tremendous amount to his believability. I don't want to startle anyone when I said he, he being deposited there, no. meaning from a great fish or a whale or... Yeah. But we have had that, that uh, happen before in semi-modern times where yeah. people have been swallowed there, by a there, there, There's one time when they recovered a complete horse have been swallowed by a whale. But you know, that, that is a good point, though. That is a kind of a point of authority there because people saw that happen. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it implies it anyway, and they probably knew the story. Yeah. And um, they, you know, the fish gods back then were. Okay, well, is let, this, let's. Is this saying that you should not, um, is not a matter of one's own interpretation, that you should pray for the Holy Spirit? and that the Holy Spirit um, mm -hmm. uh, interprets prophecy, because it goes on to talk about false teachers mm -hmm. who are speaking their own minds and not what the Holy yeah. Spirit, they haven't even asked the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Ken, when was Second Peter written? Ruth? Okay, let's, oh. let, let's talk about who wrote it and when it was written. And, and the reason I was asking that is because that'll show the timeline that it's after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. A long time. So he's speaking as someone who's already been there with the Lord. Yes. This is later, 
but he yet he's still referring back to the prophets of old who have wisdom and knowledge from God to teach. Look at let's just this this get a little hint up that some verses that will give us an idea. Look at the first Peter. We'll talk about who who wrote the book and why, why it was written, and that'll help us to give a little information also about the timing. Look at uh, chapter five at the end of chapter five, First Peter chapter five. I'm going to start with verse twelve. First Peter five verse twelve. I write you this brief letter with the help of Silas. Now that's important because the vocabulary and so forth in First Peter. First Peter is very polished Greek, very nice Greek. Second Peter is not so nice Greek. <laughs> it's uh, more like uh, someone like Peter, who came from uh, an Aramaic-speaking area, uh, might, uh, who learned Greek as a second language, more likely something that he would write. And we might find out why. So this person that he mentioned is uh, polishing up his uh, Peter's Possibly. writing? That's, that's one of the possibilities. Whom I regard as a faithful fellow Christian, Silas, I want to encourage you and give, you, give my testimony that this is the true grace of God, stand firm in it. Your sister church in Babylon, also chosen by God, sends you greetings, and so does my son, Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of Christian love. My, may peace be with all of you who belong to Christ. Who's this sister church in Babylon? Rome. Isn't that a sneaky way of saying Rome? It's a sneaky way of saying Rome. Look at Revelation. It's many times in, in the book of Revelation. The code word, Babylon is a code word for, um, for Rome. So, so is he it talking sounds about like the Christian church in Rome? Yes. Mm -hmm. And when, when, what time in his life did Peter get to Rome? Right at the end. When he was arrested and almost to be killed. And now you need to drop over to the second book. Look at Second Peter 1. What would we say to people who say he was talking about Jerusalem? I've heard people say it wasn't uh, Babylon. Babylon. Mm -hmm. well, is it a code word for Jerusalem? Mm -hmm. I've heard it. I know. Where did it say? I know. I know. No, I've I heard. Yeah, because this is, that's where he lived. And where his historical you're movement. To one where it says where our Lord was crucified. They use a lot of scripture so here, here and, and there, there. So. Mm -hmm. to make the point that it was Jerusalem because uh, that's where he lived. And they will go back to maps, and I've looked at them, and to show his journey, and they believe that he Peter's was. Mm -hmm. Because there aren't, there's not much information about Peter's journey, so a lot of that stuff must be uh, whether they get where they get it from. Is it of their own interpretation? Yep, they pull little scriptures in and there. Well, look at Second Peter, chapter two. I'm sorry, chapter one, verse ten. And I want to compare, compare this a little bit with what we just read from 1 Peter 5. It might give us some clues. So then, my brothers and sisters, try even harder to make God's call and His choice of you a permanent experience. If you do so, you will never abandon your faith. In this way, you will be given the full right to enter the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, I will always remind you of these matters. I will always remind you of these matters, even though you already know them and are firmly grounded in the truth you have received. I think it only right for me to stir up your memory of these matters as long as I am still alive. I know that I shall soon put off this mortal body, as our Lord Jesus Christ plainly told me. I will do my best then to provide a way for you to remember these matters at all times after my death. Okay, we need a little bit of history. God told him, Jesus told him that he was going to yeah. Be crucified or going to die? And who was it that wanted in on it? And God said, John. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that one of those last meetings of Jesus with the disciples over in the Gospel of John, it talks about Peter. Remember, Jesus said three times to him, feed my lambs, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, and so forth. And then he says, you know, when you're old, your hands will be bound, etc. So here he's talking about that. But notice, how would you let, continually remind people of the matters, and he's apparently talking about the life of Christ, after you're dead? In your writings? What writing? When? <laughs> write a letter. <laughs> write a letter, write a, write a book or something, yeah. Um, do we have any evidence that Peter ever wrote a gospel? 
this was not written by him? Th this isn't a gospel. This is a letter. Perhaps Mark. Perhaps Mark. Where'd you get that idea? Well, don't they usually refer to that uh, Mark was Peter's gospel? Yeah, why would they say that? Was, are you saying that Peter was not a good writer and he had to have all these, or he asked these people to help him write? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that Peter apparently didn't write anything till the, until basically the very end of his life. He had been arrested. He's now in prison in Rome. Yeah. And who's with him there? Sounds like Silas was. Silas was helping him write this letter, but mm -hmm. your sister church in Babylon, also chosen by God, sends you greetings, and so does my son, Lord. Mark. Yes. Do we have any gospel by the name of Mark? Could be. <laughs> Could be. It is. The gospel of Mark is really Peter's gospel. There's a lot of evidence for that. We don't have time to go over that now, but there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the gospel of Mark is actually Peter's rendition of the gospel story, but probably written down by Mark, and that's how it gets to have John's Mark's name. See, Peter was not an educated man. No. Like um, None of the disciples Paul, really Paul were. was very educated. Yes. And he could write. But mm -hmm. how do you expect a fisherman mm -hmm. who probably didn't even go to community college to write something mm -hmm. like okay. this? So. Well, one of the things that's... Um, that's and the Holy Spirit inspired them. Yes. Oh. As they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Yes. And don't put many limits on what people can That's do true. under that. Under Ellen that White only went to third grade. That's right. Wash my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a, if you uh, were with us last time when we uh, were talking about James, Martin Luther liked First Peter, but he didn't like Second Peter. Why do you suppose that is? Did he think Second Peter did not? flow after first Peter? How could he split the Peters up? Well, he, he did. And a lot of other scholars do. Most scholars will admit that first Peter probably was written at least in the first century. Some of them want to put second Peter clear into maybe even in the third century, at least in the second century, maybe in the third century. But Peter didn't live that long. No. They think it was written by somebody else just using Peter's name. So how would we reproach that? How would we respond? Well, the difference in the language, the polished first Peter is versus the not so polished second Peter, is probably, as we suggested by, in, suggested by the fact that Peter had a, a, a very good Greek writer by the name of Silas or Silvanus in Latin that helped him with the Greek of first Peter. Apparently he wasn't around because Paul, Peter doesn't mention him in second Peter. He may have had Mark helping him. And Mark, where did Mark come from? His hometown was Jerusalem. He wasn't a native Greek speaker either. Okay? But it's, anyway, that's, I, that's probably enough on that. We don't want to go into a lot of detail, but... The author of this Bible seems to think Peter wrote um, Second Peter, so there are people... Conservative scholars believe that, first, that Peter wrote both of them. I agree with that, absolutely. But there are arguments. Part of the reason for it is because there are very specific arguments about things that are going to happen clear at the end of this world. And it talks, First Peter talks a lot about persecution. And so that fit with what was going on in the days of Peter, uh, either under Nero or later under the mission. Um, so, but Second Peter is completely different. But once again, aren't, aren't people who make that kind of, of logic kind of putting down what the Holy Spirit can do when he inspires someone? Sure. If that's your criteria, then that's a different, a different story. When yeah. did persecution of Christian really do? Well, there were was, there was several times when, there were time, up and down times. Of course, Christianity was never a legal religion until 300 plus A.D., okay? Mm -hmm. So the first fairly vigorous persecution, which didn't last very long, was in the days of Nero. That would be in the 60s. Mm -hmm. The next really pretty severe persecution of Christians was in the 90s and the days of Domitian. Mm -hmm. A third uh, really, really severe persecution came between 300 and 310 A.D. under 
Constantine, I believe, wasn't it? It was, it was the... Just before Constantine. Was it just before? Diocletian? Diocletian, maybe it was Diocletian. So. Anyway, so those were three times when it was really, really severe against Christians. But all the time in between, it wasn't... Christians weren't really looked upon with very much favor. They were being thrown to the lions and used as, as uh, covered with tar and burned and all kinds of stuff. Well, let's move on and look at something in the book. Of course, there was quite a persecution that began at the time of Paul, in, 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 when yeah. Saul was persecuting the church. Right, that was in Judea. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, let's move into the books and see what we can what we can learn as we look at some passages. I should mention one other thing of interest. Some people, as we've already suggested, want to separate these two books, suggesting that uh, uh, First Peter and Second Peter don't belong to each other at all. Uh, in 1958, an announcement was made of a discovery of a third century papyrus. So this is now 200 some years, but that's not very far as as these kind of things go. 200 some, years something, from Jesus. I mean, yeah, a couple hundred years from Jesus. They found a document, and in this document, there's First Peter. Things from First Peter, not the whole book, but but things from First Peter, then things from Second Peter, and then things from Jude, all in the same document, which seems to suggest that somebody at that point in time thought that these were all inspired works. Mm. And if you read through the ancient documents, you'll find that some people came down on one side and some people came down on the other side about whether these books were inspired or not. But the truth is, that by about the year 400. Um, they all, pretty much all the churches, had accept, accepted both First and Second Peter um, as being inspired. Um, let me just read, read to you briefly this introduction from the Message Bible. Paul's concise confession, you are the Messiah, the Christ, focused the faith of the disciples on Jesus as God among us, in person, carrying out the eternal work of salvation. Peter seems to have been a natural leader, commanding the respect of his peers by sheer force of personality. And every listing of Jesus' disciples, Peter's name is invariably first. In the early church, his influence was enormous and acknowledged by all. By virtue of his position, he was easily the most powerful figure in the Christian community. And his energetic preaching, ardent prayer, bold healing, and wise direction confirmed the trust placed in him. I have a question. Yeah. Is this the same Peter that denied Jesus yes. three times? This is the same Peter. Okay, so this is after Jesus' resurrection. Well, and maybe we should give you a little hint about what was to come. Look at uh, Acts. Um, look at chapter 4. And let's start with about, let's see, verse 10. Um, let's move back a little before that. Look at, uh, well, let's, let's start from verse 5. Now, Peter and John had healed a man. What chapter and verse? Acts chapter five, 4, I'm sorry. And I'm starting from verse 5. Acts okay. chapter 4, starting with verse 5. And Peter and John had healed a man and in the name of Jesus, and now the whole city is stirred up by this, and the Pharisees are there raging mad because pe people are still preaching the name of Jesus. The next day, the Jewish leaders, and Peter and John had been thrown into prison, so they bring them out the next morning. The next day, the Jewish leaders, the elders, and the teachers of the law gathered in Jerusalem. They met with the high priest Annas, with Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the others who belonged to the high priest family. They made the apostles stand before them and ask them, How did you do this? What power have you got, or whose name did you use? Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, notice the difference in the change in Peter, Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, answered them, Leaders of the people and elders, if we are being questioned today about the good deed done to the lame man and how he was healed, then you should all know, now this is Peter, now standing in front of the entire Sanhedrin, the, the high priest, the whole high priest family. I mean, this is the whole government. And he's standing in front of the whole government. What does he say? You should, and you should all know, and all the people of Israel should know, that this man stands here before you completely well through the power of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from, de from death. And the, the, the Sadducees in the group must have turned purple and green. Because, and <laughs> <laughs> of course, they didn't believe anybody could be raised from the dead. 
So we have a changed Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. He, he went on and he even said even stronger things. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. well, Salvation is found in no one else. Exactly. The, and, and read the, verse 13, following it. The members of the council were amazed to see how bold Peter and John were and to learn that they were ordinary men of new education, meaning, of course, they weren't educated in our schools. They realized then that they had been companions of Jesus. Things have changed. How much time passed when, from when he was arrested, Herod had him arrested, and when he, later he was crucified in Rome? He was crucified. Herod arrested uh, Peter somewhere around A.D. 34, 30, well, probably, maybe even up into the early 40s, somewhere around 40, let's say, A.D. Peter was crucified upside down A.D. 67. So we're talking 25 years. Was he about a 70-year-old man by then? Probably. Or? Probably a little bit more than that. And he was arrested when now? He was arrested, well, when, he was arrested probably Roughly around AD. 65, 66, okay. somewhere in there. He, he was crucified in AD 67. So he was pretty spry for his age. He traveled around with his wife and family. He never mentions those. No. Mm -hmm. Well, going back to our introduction here, the way Peter handled himself in that position of power is even more impressive than the power itself. He stayed out of the center, didn't wield power, maintained a scrupulous subordination to Jesus. Given his charismatic personality and well-deserved position at the head, he could easily have taken over, using the, pre the prominence of his association with Jesus to promote himself. That he didn't do it, given the frequency with which spiritual leaders do exactly that, is impressive. Peter is a breath of fresh air. The two letters Peter wrote exhibit the qualities of Jesus that the Holy Spirit shaped, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the qualities of Jesus that the Holy Spirit shaped in him, that is in Peter. A readiness to embrace suffering rather than prestige, and the first book of Peter, first epistle of Peter, is all about standing brave under persecution. A humility that lacked nothing in vigor or imagination. From what we know of the early stories of Peter, he had in him all the makings of a bully. That he didn't become a bully, and religious bullies are the worst kind, but rather the boldly confident and humbly self-effacing servant of Jesus Christ that we discern in all these letters is a compelling witness to what he himself describes as a brand new life with everything to live for. Hmm. Pretty amazing, huh? Now, was Peter one of the ones Jesus called sons of thunder? That was James and John. Okay. But John hung out with Peter a lot. They worked together a lot. So it gives you faith that Jesus can work with any personality if he work with a spontaneous, impulsive, mm -hmm. uh, cowardly, afraid person. Uh -huh. Yeah, how, what do you think made that difference in, in Peter? Why did he, I mean, in a short time, he went from being scared to death when the maid, maid pointed her finger at him to being standing in front of the Sanhedrin and said, you were the ones who killed this Jesus and it was his name that gave power to raise, you know, to heal this man and so forth and so forth. And that's... He you saw a, his best friend being raised from the dead. Yeah. You have a confidence in something that nothing else... Uh, you, you line your priorities up pretty well. You don't have any fear. Okay. Well... There's a church that makes a lot of, takes Peter very seriously and makes a lot about him. Who is that? Which church is that? <laughs> the Catholic Church yeah. thinks he holds the keys and that he and, gave the and, keys to the first pope. And where it? did that idea come from? Stone in the rock. Hope you tell us. Okay. Look at Matthew 16. Okay. We knew it was around here someplace. <laughs> Matthew 16, I'm going to start from verse 13. Jesus went to the territory near the town of Caesarea Philippi. Now that's way up in the north, north even from, from, from Galilee, in pagan territory, where he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Some say John the Baptist, they answered. Others say Elijah, while others say Jeremiah or some other prophet. And there are reasons why they mention all those things. 
What about you? He asked them. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Boy. What, wow. what uh, verse are you on? That's, I just read, just read verse 15. 16, I'm sorry. 16. 15 and 16. Matthew 16, 15 and 16. Good for you, Simon, son of John, John, uh, son of John, answered Jesus, for this truth did not come to you from any human being, but it was given to you directly by my Father in heaven. And so I tell you, Peter, you are a rock, and on this rock foundation I will build my church, and not even death will ever be able to overcome it. Now there's the verse. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What you prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven, and what you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Then Jesus ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So, I mean, isn't that pretty clear that Peter was given the keys and that's it? That should solve it, shouldn't it? They're all given the keys because it says in other parts, what you lose in heaven is lost, but not just in this. Okay, part. you can say that, but I, I, mean, I need some evidence. Where it you says going? the word for Peter, Petros, means a small stone. Jesus used a play on words here with Petra, which means a foundation boulder. So he said, Peter, you're a small little stone, mm -hmm. and upon this rock, whoops, I didn't mean to hit my microphone there, uh, I will build my church, meaning himself, the big boulder. Okay. That's how this footnote says. Okay, well that's fine, that's somebody's idea. Do we have any scriptural evidence for that? Yeah, it doesn't seem, it seems like uh, the writer would have made that clear if he was, Jesus was pointing to himself, mm -hmm. you know, for as well, being the, the look at 2, 19 and 20 okay. talks about. B before you go there, I'm, we're going to go there next. So I want to read one verse before we, leave, before we leave Matthew. If you go over to chapter 18, just a couple chapters later, and you look at verse 18 and 19, and so I tell all of you. Now in 16, he told Peter, didn't he? Now in chapter 18, verse 18, it says, and so I tell all of you. What you prohibit on earth will be permitted in heaven. What you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. And I tell you more, whatever two of you, you on earth agree about anything you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, I am there with them. So everybody, these presumably is talking about all the disciples, have that same power, right? Okay, so now we go to Ephesians 2. And what do you find there? 19 and 20. Okay, so then you Gentiles are not foreigners or strangers any longer. You are now fellow citizens with God's people and members of the family of God. You too are built upon the foundation laid by the apostles and prophets, the cornerstone being Christ Jesus himself. So there's the evidence that Christ Jesus is the cornerstone. But who's laying that foundation? His disciples or the apostles? Apostles and prophets. Apostles and prophets. So they're laying, and who else is, who's supposed to be a part of the building? All of us. Every one of us. We're all supposed to be stones in the building. We're all supposed to be a part of Christ's family, of Christ's temple, if you will. Did Peter recognize that? Yep. Where do you go? Do you know where? First Peter 2, 4, and 5. Okay, look at First Peter 2. And we're about running out of time for our first half section here. Let's look at this very quickly. Come to the Lord, Peter says. Come, uh, the living stone rejected by the people is worthless, but chosen by God as valuable. Come as living stones and let yourselves be used in building the spiritual temple. And we'll have to finish when we come back. Don't go away.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. We were looking at some evidence from Paul and Peter that the church wasn't just built on Peter. Paul says very clearly that the chief cornerstone was Jesus Christ in Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. And Peter says, starting from 1 Peter chapter 4, Come to the Lord, the living stone, rejected by people as worthless, but chosen by God as valuable. Come as living stones and let yourselves be used in building the spiritual temple. That's exactly what Paul said, wasn't it? You're supposed to, each one of us is supposed to be a stone to be built into that temple, where you will serve as holy priests to offer spiritual and acceptable sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. For the scripture says, I chose a valuable stone which I am placing as a cornerstone in Zion, and whoever believes in him will never be disappointed. The stone is of great value for you that believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone which the builders rejected is worthless, turned out to be the most important of all, and so forth. And who is that referring to? Even Jesus himself says that that's a reference to himself, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. So we have pretty good evidence there on, on, on that. Okay, so we're not trying to reject the Catholic Church. We're just saying that that's not the whole story, right? Well, look at 1 Peter 2.9, and, and Norm, I think you've got the yeah. King James or the New King James. Uh, I'll try to get it. <laughs> but you, uh, you were I don't looking. have it here now. Okay. For, anybody have uh, one of the more traditional translations? One, first, oh, actually, I can get to it here. 1 Peter 2.9, I'll get it there for you in just a second. Um, the New American Standard is not traditional, right? It's pretty traditional. What is 1 Peter 2.9? But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let me read you from the King James. I've got it here. Um, and we're looking at, hold on, what? why is it taking me there? Just a second. Shall I read it? Or yeah. Myra has it here. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a pe peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Do we want to be peculiar? It's unique. doesn't yeah. mean goofy. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, important example. Or yeah, it means special. Uh, it's an important example of, of how words have changed. In, this, in the writing in the times of the King James, peculiar meant something that was your special possession. Your very special, what you really treasure, that's your peculiar possession. So when God says, I want you to be a holy nation, my peculiar people, he's not saying, you bunch of strange characters, you know. I don't know why I put up with you, but no. He's saying, you are my very, very special treasured possession. That's what that word means. Why do you ask this question, though? Mm -hmm. If you are what he expects you to be, mm -hmm. will you be considered by the world a treasured possession, or will you be considered peculiar? Well, we're, we're not going to be considered by the world a treasured possession if we're considered by God a treasured possession, that's for sure. That's exactly right. Odd, straight-laced, there's another word. Odd, odd straight-laced. Well, odd something, straight-laced extremists. Yeah. <laughs> Why do sometimes uh, it's the word peculiar is used as something purchased? Well, that's, that goes back to the old original meaning. But in our day, peculiar means someone who's strange. So the word has changed its meaning. Okay? Well, um, look at 1 Peter 3, um, 14 to 16. 1 Peter 3... 14 to 16. I'm getting you some getting real exercise and moving around in your Bible here. What do you think about this? Is this a way we ought to treat Peter people? 14? Yeah. 3, 14 to 16. But even if you should suffer for doing what is right, how happy you are. Do not be afraid of anyone. Do not worry, but have reverence for Christ in your hearts and honor him as Lord. Be ready at all times to answer anyone who asks you to explain the hope you have in you, but do it with gentleness and respect. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are insulted, those who speak evil of your good conduct as followers of Christ will be ashamed of what they say. Now, how can we give 
you talked about straight lineage extremists. How can we give an answer to anyone who asks us, but always do it with gentleness and respect so that our consciences are clear and so people will say, yes, that, I like that. How do we do that? We don't use any cuss words. Oh, well, okay, that's a, that's a start. <laughs> Show a lot of mercy. Show a lot of mercy. speech, okay. a lot of don't graciousness. Call them dumb. Yeah. Don't Say call them dumb. Yeah. <laughs> I like what Paul said up on Mars Hill, I guess, even though they were worshiping all those statues. He, he didn't slander them. He didn't say anything like that. He yeah. was very gentle. And he, oh, you're, you're very good. Very religious people. Very religious people, you know. But then he, he went right into Jesus, though, mm -hmm. talking yeah. about Jesus. Yeah. Well, are we, are we prepared? Are we ready at any time to go and answer to anyone who asks us for the reason for our faith? I don't know about any time. It depends on what kind of mood I'm in. <laughs> but I, I have the answer. I can answer it. When you're surrounded by non-Christians for the main part, such as I am in my community, not they have, don't even know why I disappear on Saturday and I tell them and they're mm -hmm. puzzled, and a um, lot of Mormons and stuff, at any time they'll come up with the strangest question and I'll just answer their question, and that's it. They don't want to talk anymore. Just once in a while, they'll pop in with a question. And I just think you have to, uh, sometimes I say, God help me. What, you know, and you just answer. Mm -hmm. And you don't go into a long dissertation. You just answer their one question. Mm -hmm. You no know, sermon at the end, you have a pulpit call. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> you just no. They just want their one question out, answered, so and then they go away chewing on that, and later on you'll get another question, and you never know. I was so I think that answer is, I don't know, I just do it because my parents did it. Well, one time, I, answer. <laughs> one time I had to say, I don't know, I'll go ask somebody, and then I came back the next week, and Ken had given me the answer, and I told him the answer. <laughs> But you don't get that unless you're in a community of non-believers and non-Christians. So in Loma Linda, I don't think, well, maybe you have more non-Christians here, but do you ever get asked? I mean, are you ever out of? I, I should tell you that I was attending Johns Hopkins University many years ago, uh -huh. and I had one of my classmates just ask some really b crazy questions, like right out of the blue, I answered, tried to answer the question. That was the end of it. I thought that was the end of it. And a couple months went by, or about a month went by, and all of a sudden I ran into her again. She had another crazy question. Yeah. I tried to answer it, and another went, b month went by, and she says, you go to church on Saturday, don't you? Yeah. Where do you go? Okay, I told her. Next week she showed up. <laughs> she, she never stopped. <laughs> Coming. They're thinking, even though you don't give them a whole sermon. Well, what I said to her, I said was this. I said, look, we're at school all week long together. We're in our classes together. There was a certain time set aside for various student activities. I said, if you, if you're, if you have questions that you, and she had a lot of questions. <laughs> so I said, okay, you and I will make a deal. She, I said, there's empty classrooms here in the, in the School of Public Health. Uh, uh, I'll bring my Bible on every, it happened to be Tuesday noon during lunch hour. I'll bring my lunch and my Bible, and you bring your lunch and your Bible, and you come with the questions, and I'll try to answer them. And she ended up being joining the Adventist Church and ended up being a professor at Loma Linda University. Whoa. Uh -huh. So It's the curious minds that want to know, and that's God probing them. And so God leads them to you, and it's our responsibility to give an answer for our faith. Well, one thing for sure is that we don't want to be an angry, bitter person when we're talking about Jesus. I saw uh, one Christian in Westwood, in downtown, Lo kind of uh, West Los Angeles, and uh, he was in the middle of the street with his Bible, and he was screaming at everyone who came by, and one Jewish man was standing there listening to him, and he was screaming at the Jewish man, and I apologized to the Jewish man, you know, not... I don't want to say on behalf of Jesus, but kind of on behalf of Jesus, I said, you know, Jesus is all about love and, you know, this is not right. And so I think he, he gained a better understanding. Well, didn't Jesus have that demon-filled lady that was going around screaming mm. after him and he told her to stop? That was Paul. Or that was Paul? Well, she was distracting also. Yeah. 
Last well, week. You know that pe that question though you were talking about. The question actually fulfills Peter also when he was up against the, you know, the powers that be when he made his answers right then. Mm -hmm. It's not just answers so you can convert somebody. It's some people do ask the questions um, mm -hmm. to know the answers, you know. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. was, I was at the doctor last week with my son, and my doctor is Seventh-day Adventist, and I, uh, not too young, a uh, man came in and sat down and said, he, he's a Seventh-day Adventist, at least I knew him as a Seventh-day seven Adventist. He used to go to Campus Hill, and he told me, I had, he told everybody, I had a revelation. We are not supposed to leave your house on Sabbath. You are not supposed to get. It. You could tell he was a little shaky. Uh, yeah, he kept he kept going on and on and on, and he told everybody something really strange. A very famous pastor. He said they're lying to you. She she's dead. She's dead, and she dead. and it was really strange. And my son was looking at me str strangely, and then I told my doctor, and he came out and talked to him, and I, he took his time and talked to him, and he kept going on and on and. He had a revelation. Okay, well, let's go back to First Peter. Okay, now there are some things in First Peter and some other things in Second Peter that are a little bit hard to um, to figure out. Let's take a little bit of time in First Peter, and then we'll go over to some of the really significant things in Second Peter. Um, look at First Peter chapter three, verse eighteen, and following. First Peter, and I'm going to read this in the King James because. It's closer to the, a little closer the, to the literal Greek. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. <laughs> that That's does not make sense. Per perfectly clear to everybody, right? <laughs> Missed a few things. <laughs> I've got question marks beside that. You. you have questions marks beside that? Well, we don't have time to go into a lot of detail, but it's interesting that there's a story almost exactly like this in a pseudepigraphical book called First Enoch. Mm -hmm. And it talks about Jesus helping... Enoch going and preaching to the spirits in prison before the, in, 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 a, in a metaphorical prison before the flood. You have only a certain amount of time and then the flood's coming, so that's a sort of metaphorical prison. So is it possible that Peter was borrowing something from an uninspired source? Well, when you're in sin, do they say you're in prison? Yeah. And when you're out of sin, you're free? Mm -hmm. So are these the spirits who are enslaved by sin instead of in prison? I mean, that's just their way of saying the spirits who are, who are just being consumed by sin? Okay, let me, let me just read from a commentary. That was a guess. Okay. Yeah. This passage is one mm -hmm. of the most difficult to interpret in the entire Bible. There being more than 90 variations of interpretation attempted by Christian scholars since the second century. Mm. Generally, however, these may be reduced to four plausible understandings. One, Jesus descended into Hades, the realm of the dead, between his crucifixion and resurrection to proclaim judgment upon those who condemn, those condemned in the Old Testament period. Now that's a message that is proclaimed by Roman Catholic theology. Would you so, accept that one? Jesus, well, let's, let's look at all of them before we make any judgments. The idea that between his death and his resurrection, Jesus was busy preaching to, to spirits somewhere in, among the dead. Is that, is that what they mean when they say he descended into hell? Yeah. Okay. Two, Jesus descended into Tartarus, the place of confinement for fallen angels, to proclaim judgment to the fallen angels. That's another possible interpretation. Three, Jesus descended in, into a realm of Hades known as paradise, in which Old Testament saints were held until the atonement could be actually historically accomplished. So now he's preaching to saints, but they can't go to heaven yet because the atonement hasn't happened. Is that like purgatory? No. No, no okay. these people, these are saints. Okay. They, but it's a little bit like purgatory, because in purgatory, 
you may have to be there for a long time, but everybody out of purgatory eventually gets to heaven. Holy room of some sort. Yeah. The preaching would be the message of the finished atonement at Golgotha. So these people have to wait, and Jesus is going to them now and saying, guess what? I, I paid the price. Now this atonement is prepared. Now you can go to heaven. Or four, the Spirit of Christ preached through Noah, and maybe even Enoch, concerning impending judgment to the disobedient souls of men in the antediluvian or pre-flood civilization. The latter two views are the more popular among evangelicals and are also the more feasible. The third view offers explanation of what's in Ephesians 4, 8, and 9, to the effect that Christ descended to the lower parts of the earth and led captivity captive. And this fourth view, there's... Um, with Peter's assessment, well, the fourth view better explains the specific mention of the antediluvians and their disobedience. It is in accordance with Peter's assessment of Noah as a preacher of righteousness. In this fourth view, also fewer difficulties are involved in the harmonizing the statements of Jesus from the cross. Today you'll be with me in paradise, and Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So what are we going to do with that? Well, if you happen to go into the Greek, there's a very attractive conjectural emendation, and I happen to know about this because I wrote a, my master's degree the uh, thesis on conjectural emendations. It turns out that by, remember we read, sorry, here we read a passage which says, in which also Christ, uh, by which also, in the beginning of verse 19, 1 Peter 3, 19, by which also, that by which also is en ho kai in Greek. And if it said, by which also, and then the next word was enok, we had enokai enok, someone might be reading along and say, oh, I already wrote that down, and, and leave out the enoch. So if you read that, if that word got dropped out of there by accident, then we would read verse 19, it would read like this, by which also enoch went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, and then it makes perfectly good sense. So it's just possible that the name of Enoch got dropped out there about the third or fourth word in verse 19. Say the whole word again, what it should have been. What, in Greek? Uh, yeah. En ho kai en oak. En ho kai oak. And you're saying one of those syllables might have, because well, it's, it's a repetition. It's, it's three words, en ho kai in Greek, by which also. But then if the name of Enoch would be next, it would say, if you were actually reading it, for example, it said, Hanho Kai Henok, it would sound like you were just saying the same thing over again almost. Okay. And someone said it got dropped out because somebody thought, oh, well, I already, already heard that or I already wrote that down. Is there a, con is there a consensus on who the spirits are? Are they like angels? They're, they're spirits there are talking about people, human beings. Through whom or through, through which? Through which also, through whom also, it could be. Depends on the translator. And Hokai, by whom? It would really be by whom. It's ho. It's a, it's masculine singular, in Greek. Okay. Well, let's go to something of more consequence, and that would be Second Peter chapter three. Now, this is a this is a chapter which has disturbed a lot of people. Um, is this the book that Martin Luther did not like? This is the book, Second Peter chapter, I mean, Second Peter is the one that Martin Luther didn't like because it talks a lot about things like we've just talked about. It talks about spirits in prison and, and maybe even some, some parts borrowed from pseudo-epigraphical books. And then here at chapter 3, it's all talking about things at the very end of it. The, and there's none of by faith you will be saved, and so forth and so forth, and the things. That's what Martin Luther was looking for. Peter's giving some really hard warnings in, in Second Peter. Yes. Yeah. And not just one or two or three or four. Yeah. It seems like he just keeps going. Quite a few. Well, look at Second Peter chapter 3. See what you, how you feel about this. My dear friends, this is now the second letter I have written to you. Now, does that make you more want to believe it's a true letter, or does that make you think this person is trying to write a forgery? People have taken it both ways. Okay? In both letters, I have tried to arouse pure thoughts in your minds by reminding you of these, excuse me, these things. I want you to remember the words that were spoken long ago by the Holy Prophets and the command from the Lord and Savior, which was given you by your apostles. First of all, you must understand that in these last days, some people, 
uh, in these last days, some people will appear whose lives are controlled by their own lusts. They will mock you and ask, He promised to come, didn't He? Where is He? Our ancestors have already died, but everything is still the same as it was since the creation of the world. Now, stop there for a second. Does that sound like any modern theories? Yes. <laughs> same song, second verse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did Peter know that people would be talking about evolution in long time periods with almost no change? How did he know that 2,000 years ago? And it's interesting, following that, that he goes on to say that the, you know, that the earth was formed. Mm -hmm. They purposely ignore the fact that long ago God gave a command and the heavens and earth were created. That's exactly what they want to deny. The earth was formed out of water and by water, and it was also by water, the water of the flood, that the old world was destroyed. I mean, this is a perfect picture of the modern... And the world Darwinian is evolution. The surface of the world is 80% mm -hmm. covered by water, the earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Today, and, you know, yeah. we don't, uh, a lot of people don't believe in creation and they don't believe in a worldwide flood. Mm -hmm. And right here, mm -hmm. he, Peter's talking about those two. Yeah. And we can find evidence of this worldwide flood. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's interesting that it's all right here and it's talking about the end times and the you know, the conflict there. Yep. Ooh, and he goes on. But the heavens and the earth that now exist are being preserved by the command, by the same command of God in order to be destroyed by fire. They are being kept for the day when godless people will be judged and destroyed. And that's exactly why people don't want to believe in the gospel. They've rejected this book and all the other books in Scripture because they don't want to think that someday they're going to face a judgment. Yeah. It reads it also, verse 8. But do not forget one thing, my dear friends. I'm, I'm, we're getting ready to go on. But do not forget one thing, my dear friends. There is no difference in the Lord's sight between one day and a thousand years. To him, the two are the same. Uh, okay. Maybe people were already saying, because they thought, long time ago, they thought uh, Jesus' return was imminent. Mm -hmm. Maybe some people were getting a little bit Peter and Paul. Peter mm -hmm. and Paul thought Jesus was going to come in their day. Yes. These are the thoughts of last day scoffers. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Being fulfilled in our, in our earth right around us. And, and well, is, is yeah. some of this even in some of our universities? Yes. Well, Peter goes on to say, The Lord is not slow to do what he has promised, as some think. Instead, he is patient with you, because he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants all to turn away from their sins. But the day of the Lord will come, like a thief. On that day, the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise, the heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed, and the earth, with everything in it, will vanish. Does he have any questions about what's going to happen in the future? No. Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God as you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon. Do our best to make it come soon. How does that work? The day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat. But we wait for what God has promised, new heavens and a new earth where righteousness will be at home. Are we really have anything to do with hastening the second coming? We must. Certainly have to do with delaying the second coming. No. So we can delay it, we can't hasten it. But if we can prevent delaying, we... That would be hastening, wouldn't it? Well, you know, also that verse 10 is uh, for the rapture, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And I was told that by one of my friends, and so we're going to be raptured away. And I says, well, don't stop there. There's no period in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements. He didn't read past the comma. Oh, no, no, they don't want to do that. There's and of course, yeah, I guess you were going to say in the uh, Greek the presuppositions uh, you know they can't they, God's going to do something for it for the good guys you can't let them suffer this idea Jesus suffered you know it seems like though when any group of people gets warned about something they all kind of believe that everything's going to remain the same sure. that those changes aren't really going to happen until it actually does and then, mm -hmm. and then it happens yeah, yeah. Half, halfway through, I'd just like to point out 
one little couple of little things. Halfway through verse 9, it says, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, mm -hmm. but everyone to come to repentance. Mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, he, He's a loving God. He has us in mind. He's taking His time. That wanting us all to come to him. Is, is that a practical desire to have everybody? But that does well, not. Well, that's always God has always said that he would it, he would like to save everybody. So he's that, always said that. That does not speak of predestination, then. No. That, that no, no. Verse. No, no. And we should always be very careful when we're reading the New Testament about punctuation, mm -hmm. as there apparently there was no punctuation in the Greek itself. Mm -hmm. So. But I'd encourage everyone to read and consider greatly. Mm -hmm. What I find also amazing is that Peter had no, had no knowledge of we would be able to go to and fro. There'll be satellites going everywhere, yeah. and every, you know, and all those things needs to happen. Everyone has to have a chance to know about the gospel and accept it or reject it before. Mm -hmm. And what does what do the books of First and Second Peter tell us about God that we don't learn elsewhere? Well, I think I have learned several things from the book of books of First and Second Peter. I think it's important to remember where Peter came from, and now what these books say about where he's where he's re how far he's reached, and he's speaking like this while he's waiting in a terrible dungeon in Rome by the name of the Mamertine prison, and he's just waiting for it to be crucified upside down. And he has a pretty good idea that that's coming. That's pretty amazing considering back at the time when he was scared to even mention the name of Jesus. Uh, I think these books show, show us that God worked with him from, from talking about times of persecution and all sorts of troubles up to these things that we have just read about what's coming in the distant future for, for, was, was for Peter. And it's spelling out in detail, you know, basically the theory of, of evolution many, many, many years ago. I think the books of Peter show us that Peter, we, we, and we didn't get a chance to talk about this, he resolved his differences with Paul and says wonderful things about Paul just at the end of his second book that you shouldn't go back and read if you get a chance. So I think this is, the, this is an evidence of a Christian gentleman who really grew up and became the kind of Christian we all should be. See you next week.